A close study of Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751's engines reveals exactly which pieces are missing. Parts of this aircraft was shedding parts from both engines. And then what, what you do is you go further in and you document everything and you try to find the root cause and see how it all comes together. The missing pieces could hold the key to discovering why both of the plane's engines quit within seconds of each other. But they could be anywhere along the 15-kilometer route the aircraft covered during its short flight. They must be found. Investigators use the flight data recorder to map the plane's journey and determine where engine parts may have fallen. After scouring the snow-covered fields along the plane's path, the recovery team finds 500 fragments. Just a fraction of what's missing. Many are very badly damaged. Some of the titanium blades actually seem to have been on fire. You had this titanium fire inside both engines, both the right and the left engine. And this titanium fire is a very unique occurrence. You, it's requiring very, very high pressure and very high temperature for a titanium blade to catch fire. Investigators dig deeper into the cause of the engine trouble. The left engine's fuel line is badly dented. It was obviously hit by a fast-moving piece of metal inside the engine. The impact caused it to rupture. This part got dislodged. It went out and hit a fuel line, and that fuel line cracked, sprayed fuel onto the hot engine. The engine was clearly coming apart during the flight. That sounds serious. The discovery explains the fire in the left engine and why so many pieces of it were found so far from the crash site. But investigators are left wondering why the engines broke up in the first place. A major clue comes from passenger and crew testimonies, which told of repeated booming noises before the left engine caught fire. The cockpit voice recorder picked up these sounds. So you can hear that, then we could correlate that with when uh, the damage occurred. You can see that on the flight data recorder. The sounds are familiar to investigators and leave no doubt. The DC-9's engines began surging shortly after takeoff. Jet engines rely on a steady stream of air for combustion. A series of fans move incoming air through various stages of compression. But when that flow is disrupted, fuel at the rear of the engines ignites violently and shoots forward. That's a surge. You can have a small surge, and you can have a large surge, and you can have the complete surge on the whole engine. It sounds serious. This surge process was very violent, so after a very short time, we had an aircraft with two engines that could not be restarted, that didn't generate any thrust. Basically, you had a giant glider uh, at that point. A closer look at the fan blades from the front of the engines explains why they were surging. They're badly dented. The damage would have prevented them from effectively directing air to the rear of the engines. This damage that twisted the fan blade started this process. You got this disturbed air in the fan. You got this rotating fan stall that then triggered this whole breakdown, the compressor surge and then the whole process that led up to the dual engine failures. But what exactly mangled the blades? There are ways to tell. Uh, if it comes from a stone, rubber, ice, and so on, you can see it on, on the shape of the damage. The ice causes very specific uh, damages. It's, it's sort of like a soft dent. Analysis of dent patterns on the fan blades is conclusive. They were struck by ice. Now investigators want to find out where the ice could have come from. Weather data for the 24 hours leading up to the crash. They know Stockholm had been hit with rain and snow in the hours before Flight 751 took off. It was a situation 
with the, uh, the temperature around zero degrees. It was a drizzle, snow, rain in the morning. They learned that the DC-9 arrived from Zurich the night before, with the fuel tanks more than half full. They had quite a large amount of reserve fuel, of diversion fuel, in their wings. The, the fuel in the wing tanks were close to minus 20 degrees Celsius. The conditions that night were ideal for the formation of clear ice on the wing surface. And here you had very, very cold fuel on the top wing skin. And as the temperature dropped during the night, it went to snow and rain and finally snow. So there was a layer cake. Ice at the bottom, slush and snow on top. About 10, 10 inches total on top of the wings in the morning. Responsibility for de-icing the plane ultimately falls on the captain. Rasmussen insists he was aware of the overnight buildup. Investigators wonder if the pilot did all he could to ensure his plane was completely free of ice. Rasmussen claims he instructed technicians to de-ice the plane thoroughly. I didn't walk around with the aircraft. It was cold. It was uh, frosty. Noticing that there was still frost on the wings, the head technician ordered a second round of de-icing. I was really convinced that the aircraft was clean. And so was he. So was he. Where are we now with the de-icing? The wings aren't quite done. They've done the underside. The cockpit voice recorder backs up Rasmussen's testimony. They've got it good and clean under the wings? Yes, yes. They de-iced the aircraft once and looked at it and I said, once more and they de-iced as the second time. In fact, a total of 850 liters of fluid was sprayed on the aircraft. But the fluid may have been faulty, not potent enough to melt the thick layer of ice that had accumulated on the wings overnight. Technicians test samples of the fluid used to de-ice Flight 751. If we found no discrepancies, there was nothing wrong with any of the fluids used. But when investigators interview the maintenance crew that worked on the plane, they begin wondering if the de-icing team was thorough enough in their efforts. The ground crew insists that after they sprayed the wing, it appeared to be clean. But that appearance was deceptive. It looked perfect because the clear eyes on top of the fuel tanks, you cannot see the clear eyes. A technician inspected the front of the wing and found no ice. He couldn't have known that there was ice further back, out of his reach. No provisions for stairs or anything that he could use to get up on the wing at the de-icing platform. It looked shiny and nice, couldn't see any ice on it, but still there was maybe an inch of ice on top of the wing when the aircraft took off. As soon as the plane took flight, the ice became a problem. On this aircraft, the engines are positioned behind the wings. And as the aircraft rotated and the wings bent in order to take the weight of the aircraft, this ice in the wing roots loosened and it sucked right into the engine. The ice damaged the fan blades at the front of the engines and ultimately caused them to begin surging. Nobody really expected that this would happen, or could happen, but it did. When ice breaks off the wings during flight, it doesn't pose a problem for most aircraft. But the placement of a DC-9's engines leaves them more susceptible to being struck. The Pratt & Whitney engines on Flight 751 were designed to withstand this type of ice ingestion. Something else must explain the disaster. Investigators know that the wrong reaction by a pilot can make surges worse. They comb through the flight data to see what these pilots did when the emergency struck. The first thing you do when you have a surge, if you recognize it as a surge, is that you reduce power. Captain Rasmussen claims he did just that. Of course, you just pull the, the throttle back, and then you have the, the balance between the incoming fuel and incoming air. And uh, that was actually what I did. But the flight data recorder tells a different story. 
Why is the engine power increasing? It clearly shows that in the moments after the surge, thrust was reduced, but then seconds later was increased to beyond full power. Yeah, it didn't add up because the, the RPM was increasing to 110%, and the throttle position was moving. It shouldn't be. The only thing that could move the throttle in clamp was the pilot's hand. But if Rasmussen didn't push the throttles forward, something else did. It would explain the captain's confusion as his engines began to surge. As a pilot, when, when you when you gone through the training, you've done all your emergency training, you've been through the simulator, and now you have a system that is doing something uh, that you don't expect, it, it's very confusing. Despite their relentless efforts, investigators can find no possible explanation for the increase in thrust. The frustrating part with the investigation was that we could not figure out why the system did what it did. Then, almost two months after the accident, the plane's manufacturer provides the answer. The culprit is something called automatic thrust restoration. It's brand new. It automatically increases the thrust during the climb. Swedish authorities learned that automatic thrust restoration, or ATR, was recently introduced as a safety feature on Scandinavian Airlines planes. It existed because the FAA had discovered some pilots were throttling back considerably while taking off and landing to reduce noise over residential neighborhoods. The ATR was designed to make it impossible for them to throttle back to dangerous levels. So as soon as he powered back, the system kicked in. Investigators learned that when Rasmussen reduced power to clear his engine surge, the system read this as a dangerously low power setting and pushed the throttles forward. The increased thrust made the surging worse until the engines destroyed themselves. The investigation concludes that the pilots had taken the right steps to clear the surge and prevent the catastrophe. But the computer code which governs the ATR undermined their efforts. The strip of zeros and ones caused the throttles to move and caused the engines that were stalling because they already got too much fuel, got even more fuel. And they went into self-destruct both engines. On the, in, the, in a few seconds, they were both totally destroyed. The system was so new to Scandinavian Airlines that nobody there had even heard of it. And it was confusing for everyone because we, we didn't know about the system, we didn't have uh, information on the system. SAS didn't know the system existed on their aircraft. We hadn't bought that modification. And it was sneaked in via another system. Because he didn't know about the ATR, Rasmussen was unaware that he could only save his plane by switching it off. News that the automatic thrust restoration was responsible for the accident proved both a blessing and a curse for Captain Rasmussen. It eliminated any notion that he had made a mistake. When I got that message, I was really released. It was like uh, winning in a lottery. It was, uh, you know, because I was so happy. Uh, because then I could explain why I was in that total cone of confusion. But the fallout would ultimately destroy a love affair and end a career. On October the 20th, 1993, the Swedish Accident Investigation Board releases its report on the crash of Flight 751. It determines that the actions of Captain Rasmussen and First Officer Sedemark contributed to the safe outcome of this incident. And although investigators question Captain Per Holmberg's decision to enter the cockpit in the first place, they do praise his contribution. This crew flew until they stood still on the ground. They never gave up. They never gave up. They didn't give an inch. 
The investigators put much of the blame for the accident on Scandinavian Airlines because their procedures for checking for clear ice were inadequate. I believe it's a compressor stall. The report also condemns the fact that the pilots didn't know about the automatic thrust restoration and how it would act in a surge situation. If the ATR system hadn't been there, if, if the trolls hadn't moved forward, uh, there wouldn't have been an accident. It was a bit strange that we didn't have all the documentation uh, available to us so we knew what we could expect if something like this would happen. In the wake of the crash, Scandinavian Airlines started training its pilots how to use the ATR system. They also implemented steps to ensure airplanes don't take off with clear ice on the wings. We changed all the procedures, we provided stairs for the mechanic, and we made it a requirement to go up on top of the wing and touch it with your hand to verify after the icing. After healing from his injuries, First Officer Ulf Sedermark returned to the cockpit. I didn't feel the responsibility that, uh, that I wouldn't be able to do my job again. Whatever happens, I know that I, I still can see things for what they are. And I still love doing my job, and if something bad happens, I can deal with it. But Stefan Rasmussen's return proved far more difficult. Set power. Arthur had help from a high-skilled psychologist. We talked about getting in the air again. He knew that that would be a hard decision to take. Gear up. Fire drill. After time in the simulator, Rasmussen couldn't regain confidence in his plane. Sorry, guys. In a disaster situation, in a, in a crisis, is that you have optimized the teamwork between man and machine. I really felt that, that I didn't trust the, the aircraft. Pilots tends to take the responsibility for all that went wrong. Too much of the glory and also too much of the responsibility. With the right counseling, about 90% of pilots involved in an accident are able to continue flying. Even though Captain Rasmussen received treatment, his career ended with the crash of Flight 751. Taking that decision to leave uh, aviation as pilot was like uh, having you, your highest love and um, come to that conclu conclusion that, um, that you have to kill her. Uh, I had many hours, many missions of happiness in an aircraft. And uh, I love my passengers, I love my aircraft so much, so I said, that's it. I never regret it, never. And I think I was right.